you know, before we jump into today's material, let's do a quick recap. And because today we're going to use uh, the things that we covered from the first week uh, to derive algorithms, right? So we eventually now this week, starting from this week, we're going to talk about algorithms rather than definitions and properties. So um, we talked about infinite horizon discounted MDP. And just to remind you, so in this definition, we often have uh, these five terms, right? So at state space, action space, and a transition probability, a conditional distribution, a reward function, and a discount factor. And um, we talk about policy, right? So we have in discrete setting, we have A to the S many different policies. And for each policy, we can define these two important quantities, the value function and the Q function. Right? And these two functions allow us to talk about sort of the long-term effect of a particular policy starting from a particular state. And uh, we talked about optimal policy on last Thursday. So the theorem says that for any discounted infinite horizon Markov decision process, there always exists a deterministic policy, pi star, that maps from state to action, right? Such that this policy actually dominates any other policy at any state right? in terms of the value function. And then we talked about the Bellman optimality. This is one of the key properties of Markov decision processes, right? So we say that for the optimal value function V star, it satisfies this sort of dynamic programming style, um, you know, consistency equation. And then for any function V that actually satisfies this equation, this Bellman consistency style equation, right? We proved that this function has to be equal to the optimal policy V star. And in the homework zero, you will actually study the Q version of this theorem. Okay, so you can show actually not only for V star, you have these nice two equations and for Q star, you can show similar stuff. Okay, so specifically you're gonna show that Bellman optimality holds for Q star. And then you're gonna show that given you a Q function that satisfied the Bellman optimality equation, you should prove, you should be able to prove that Q star, uh, the Q actually equals to Q star. Right, so they're gonna use very similar proof strategies. And another thing that I want to mention, I didn't, I forgot to put it in the slides, is that we also cover this Bellman equation. And this works for any policy pi, right? So we have V pi S equals to Right, so this is sort of the Bellman equation for a particular policy pi. And as you can see here, the actions are taken by following this policy pi. Right, so in this class, we're gonna use Bellman equation to derive an, an algorithm that works for policy evaluation. Um, okay, so we're not really gonna use state action distribution in the near future, but I just sort of wanna you know, just mention it and remind you it again because eventually this is gonna be quite useful when we get into the, uh, you know, the, the learning part of Markov decision process. Right? So we talked about how to use this graphical model right, to interpret the state action distribution at a particular time step. So this quantity basically says that, you know, what's the probability of hitting a particular state action pair SA if you follow policy pi starting from S0 for H many steps. And from a picture perspective, you know, we can draw such kind of toy problem, right? We always start from S0 and we follow policy pi, right? And then if we execute this process infinitely many times and we group sort of the state action pairs generated at a particular time step, let's see this time step, right? So maybe this ellipsoid is sort of the distribution that we would get, right? For, for all the state action pairs generated at this particular time step. <laughs> you do the same process for every time step. Now you sort of have a distribution at each time step. So this is stuff P pi, uh, one SA starting from S0, right? So along this 
time access from h equal to zero to infinite, every time step we have a distribution, right? And this uh, average state action distribution, this discounted average state action distribution is effectively sort of an infinite mixture of these distributions along each time step, right? So this is an infinite mixture because we have infinite many distributions, but we are sort of weighting each distribution using this discount factor, right? Because this discount factor says that, you know, we actually are gonna discount the future effect, right? We can do that by discount the future reward function, right? We can also do that by discount the future sort of probability, right? We purposely discounted the visitation probability for future time steps so that we can actually write our V pi S using this distribution. Right, so this is also another uh, homework problem that you will see in homework zero. Professor, I have a question. Yes. Um, so I get you talking about like the discounted probability. I was wondering if there's any intuitive reason why that one minus gamma is out there in the front. Yeah, I know that that yeah. makes it not a distribution, but is there any like... Yeah, so, so, so that's also one of the homework zero problems. So you will try to show that with this, this uh, normalization constant, one minus gamma, this becomes a valid distribution. In other that's words- just, That's just there and it's just added yeah. to the distribution. Yeah, yeah. I mean, otherwise, you know, it's not a valid distribution, right? It's like it's something that proportional to, you know, a distribution, okay. but yeah. Makes sense, thank you. I just want to remind you like the term one minus gamma, it really comes from the fact that we often doing this one plus gamma plus gamma square plus gamma cubic, right? So if you add them together, this is equal to one over one minus gamma. All right, so today we're going to talk about policy evaluation, right? We're eventually going to do algorithms, you know, for Markov decision process. So the key question for today's lecture is that if I give you a Markov decision process, right, the usual Markov decision process definition, and a particular policy, pi, and the question is how good is that policy, right? In other words, you know, how to compute the value function for that particular policy, right? How we can compute V pi s for every s. So that's the key question for today. And the motivation of policy evaluation is that you know often when we're playing a game, for instance, right? We really trying to estimate you know what's the winning probability of our particular strategy, right? So imagine abstract your strategy as a policy that maps from sort of the board position to an action, right? So we're trying to evaluate you know what's the probability of we you know winning against this alpha go system, for instance, right? And uh, for those kind of recommendation system, we often want to evaluate our strategy on this system, you know, before we release this particular strategy to users, for instance, right? We wanna get a sense of how good our new potential strategy is before we can actually safely release it to users. So these are sort of the motivation, practical motivation for policy evaluation, right? And then at the end of the day, we really wanna get a sense of how good a particular policy is. So a more fundamental motivation is that actually, you know, if we, care about computing the optimal policy for this mark of decision policy, uh, mark of decision process, right? Which will be the key uh, topic for the next lecture and the uh, lecture after the next lecture. So if you want to compute the optimal policy, right? First, the first thing that we need to do is actually do policy evaluation, right? So imagine you have many items in a set, you want to try to pick the best one out of it, but we needed the ability to evaluate each item right, in the set, before we can actually, you know, talk about how to pick the best one, right? So this basically is a more fundamental motivation. In order to compute the best policy, we need it to be able to evaluate, right? In order to compute the shortest path, we need a way to evaluate the lens of an arbitrary trajectory. Right, so then the outline for today is that we're gonna talk about two algorithms, actually, both of them are very simple like one line algorithm. So the first algorithm is the exact policy evaluation. So we're gonna derive some formulations that exactly returns V pi to us. 
right? And we will see that this exact algorithm, it's nice, it's simple, but it's computationally heavy. And then we're gonna move on to talk about an approximate algorithm, right? So in this algorithm, we will see that we're gonna return something that just approximates v pi, right? And we're basically gonna trade in for, we're basically gonna trade the accuracy for computation. So you will see that the approximate policy evaluation algorithm actually runs faster. So that's the two algorithms that we're gonna cover today. All right, so before we jump into the details of the two algorithms, I just wanna pause for a second and see if you have questions. Right. And one thing that I want to mention for this second algorithm is that we can we actually going to use the property of Bellman equation. Right. We eventually going to see you know the property that we learned from the first week. We eventually going to see how they can be used to design algorithms. So in Thursday's lecture, you will see actually how we use Bellman optimality to design algorithms to find the optimal policy. Right. So let's uh, you know set up the problem. Uh, so that we can talk about uh, the algorithms and the proofs for it. So again, we have this infinite horizon discounted Markov decision process and a particular policy pi, okay? And we just wanna sort of compute the value function for this particular policy pi. So as I said, we're gonna use the property, the Bellman equation property for this policy pi, right? And we know that for this policy pi for V pi, we actually have this Bellman equation, right? We have this linear constraint that has V pi on the left-hand side and has V pi on the right-hand side, right? And this constraint holds for every state. Right, so this basically, if you write out this constraint for every possible state in the state space, this basically gives us as many linear constraints, right? So the reason that this is a linear constraint because you have just this single v pi s on the left hand side and you have again v pi s on the right hand side right there's no nonlinear rarity involved everything's linear in this case either on about on both left side and the right hand side of this equation right so this should remind you something like linear programming constraints right so you can write out this linear constraint for every state and you get to a linear programming problem Right, so this is what we're gonna do. So we basically form this linear constraint for every state, and then we just write out all the linear constraints for every state, right? So let's just do it for two states, for instance. So for Vs1, I will have this constraint. Right, so I know that if V has to be V pi, right, we, it must satisfy this constraint by Bellman equation at state S1, right? I can do another one for state S2. Right, again, so the, the reason behind this constraint is that if we believe that this V equals to V pi, right, the quantity that we want to compute, then it must satisfy this constraint at S2 as well, right? This is just Bellman equation, right? So you can do the, the rest of the exercise, write out the constraint for every possible state S and then group them together. So the way we're going to group them together is to use some linear algebra, okay? So these notations are a bit confusing if this is the first time you see it. So let's just go slow. Remember that we have as many states, right? So we can actually first represent our estimator as a vector in the dimension of number of states, right? So you can write V as a big vector where a particular element of this vector represents the value at the particular state S, okay? And we can write this reward function using a vector as well, right? So let me just write this. So this big vector R is also a vector in RS and each element of this vector is actually the reward at a particular state S 
and the action that computed from the policy that we are interested in, we are interested in evaluate, right? And then let's define this slightly more complicated object, this transition of uh, matrix P, whose dimension is number of states times number of states. Okay, again, let's draw this picture. So P now is a vec is a matrix whose size is uh, so let's let me write it this way um, is S times S. Okay, so let's look at a particular entry in this matrix. So if I index this row by S prime and a column by S, so this entry basically says that this is the probability of we transit to S prime at state S and a taking action computed by the policy at state S. Okay, so remember what's the goal here. The high level goal here is that we write out this linear constraint, right? For every state. And let's try to group them together so that we can form, you know, sort of a, a large linear system, right? So that's why we start using linear algebra notations. We put V as a vector, right? And we put R as a vector, and we put this transition P S prime given S pi S as a giant matrix whose size is number of states times number of states. Right. Each element in the matrix is, is basically the probability of transit to a particular state given at another particular state. Can I ask a question? Yes. Um, so little r of s pi s and p of s prime given s pi s, like are those expectations over pi of s so that you end up getting just a scalar or are they? Uh, well, so, so, so here our policy is deterministic policy. So there's no expectation yet. Okay, okay. Right. So, so yeah, again, you know, we're not going to talk about stochastic policy until some, somewhere we talk about poli uh, policy gradient methods. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Professor, in the uh, P matrix, like, why is it not like indexed in the opposite direction? Because you're taking V and multiplying it by P, like, shouldn't it be across the row that the probability of the transitions are for a given state and like the column is the starting states? Oh, I see. Yeah. So, uh, good point. I think, uh, let me think about it. Um, yeah. So this, this, this transition operator P or it's, it's transpose of P is always confusing. Let me just give me one sec. I think it's correct. Um, okay. So we will get to the next page. We will basically see the picture. Uh, okay. let's, let's, let's verify, you know, if it's correct at that, that stage. Right. So let me just rephrase the question again here. So here, uh, you know, some of you are questioning about whether we should write this matrix as the way that I wrote here or write it in its transpose. Just a quick question. Yes. Um, is there a gamma missing before the summation in the first top equation? Oh yeah, sorry, you're right. Yeah, that's the, that's the key. Yeah, without that gamma, you know, the algorithm that we're gonna talk about is not gonna work. All right, so let's just look at this picture, right? So that's what we did from the previous slides. So we defined this vector V, right? And each element is indexed by a particular state. And then we have this R vector. Again, each element of this R vector is, 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 is indexed by a particular state S and the action that is computed by the policy at this particular state S, okay? And again, the policy is a deterministic policy. Let me just emphasize here again, policy is S to A. Okay, not as to a distribution on A. All right, so now we get to this confusing matrix P. Okay, so because we do inner product, right? So, so we're just gonna look at this row vector, right? So this row vector is actually the distribution on the next state if we were at state S and, um, policy and, and the action computed by S. So I think uh, whoever asked the question from the previous slide, I think you are correct because we are indexing uh, these rows by S prime and we are indexing columns by um, S. All 
right? So that's basically the, uh, the, the consequence of we combining all these linear constraints together as a big linear system. All right, so, so one thing that I wanna mention is that if you look at this particular component, right? So this is actually an inner product between two vectors, right? And this actually corresponds to the expectation because sum over S prime, P of S prime given S pi S, right? Uh, times V S prime, Right, so this is the inner product between these two vectors, right? I'm just writing out the definition of the inner product. This is by definition of the expectation, right? right? So that's why we can write the expectation, this expectation operator in the uh, Bellman equation using this inner product between two vectors. All right, so now we write the whole constraints, this S many constraints into this giant linear system, right? V equals to R plus gamma times PV, right? So we have V on both sides. So that gives us a very natural algorithm, right? We can actually just compute this V by rearranging these terms and, 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 and compute the matrix inverse. And then uh, this gives us the solution. Right, so all I did is just V of I minus gamma times P equals to R, right? By just rearranging terms. Do you have uh, invertibility guarantees on that matrix? Yes, exactly. So that's your homework questions. Right? <laughs> okay. So I can guarantee you that this is for rank and this is invertible and you're going to prove that this is for rank. Cool. I mean, it's not obvious that this matrix is actually for rank. Um, like you actually have to do a few more, a few steps. You actually have to write out a few steps to prove that this is for rank, right? So one thing that I wanna sort of uh, mention is that in order to prove a matrix is for rank, in case you, know, you kind of forget about the linear algebra stuff, if you wanna prove this matrix is for rank, what you can show is that this matrix non-space is empty. Right. Hopefully, hopefully you still remember you know, what, what a null space is. So basically, if you want to prove that this matrix A is for rank, right? So what you can show is that for all X such that X is not equal to a, a, a zero vector, right? A times X does not equal to zero vector. So in other words, you just proved that the null space of this matrix is empty. Right? If the null space of this matrix is empty, then this matrix is for rank. Right? If this is matrix is for rank, then the inverse exists. Right? That's basically uh, the first algorithm, the exact algorithm, right? Because here we write the linear constraints. We start from Bellman equation, right? We write out linear constraints for every state S. Then we find a way to combine these linear constraints so that we can write the whole linear system as this very simple you know, linear equation, right? We have a vector on the left-hand side and we have sort of uh, a vector uh, of, about reward, reward values and uh, a matrix P and vector B again. And uh, even though this algorithm gives us the exact solution, but the downside of this algorithm is that this is very computation, computational heavy in the sense that we needed to compute the matrix inverse, right? So if you still remember uh, you know, the basics of linear algebra, uh, the computing the matrix inverse is expensive in a sense that the computation scales quadratically with respect to the dimension of the matrix, right? So remember this matrix size is S by S. Right, so if your S is in the order of, for instance, 100K, I think, you know, if you do the matrix inverse in MATLAB or Python, it's gonna take actually a lot of time to compute, a lot of memory and a lot of time to compute, right? Um, so 
it's not that efficient. It's not efficient. It's not memory efficient as well. So that will lead us to the approximate algorithm. So I just want to stop here for a second and see if you have questions about the first algorithm. Hey, Professor, um, can you show again how we get the V equals to inverse time R? Sorry, I missed that part. This one? Yeah. How we get from uh, right. V equals to R PV? Uh, you mean this, this, equi this equation? Right, 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 yeah. Uh, well, so we can rearrange this term, right? To V minus gamma P times V equals to R, right? Sorry, this isn't, this is run. This should be R, right? Okay. Mm -hmm. Right, and then I just group things together. Identity plus, uh, not plus. Identity minus gamma P times vector V, right? Equals to R, correct? Right. Oh, okay. Right. okay. Yeah. And then just and I just multiply the inverse on both sides, right? All right, yeah. Thank you. Well, I have a quick question too. It's, it's kind of more like a linear algebra type question because I was wondering if, um, let's say you already done all the computational work to compute the inverse, then like later on, like you update the Markov decision process a little bit by like changing p a little bit. Would there be ways to like update the inverse without recomputing the whole thing? Uh, I don't see an obvious way. Like when it's not like, you know, this, these rank one sort of rank one matrix inverse update, right? I don't see an obvious way to do this rank one style update. Okay. Um, I mean, it's especially like you probably will also change policy pi as well, right? Remember this matrix P is, is correlated with the policy pi, right? It's the, it's the Markov transition uh, oh, okay. corresponding to the Markov chain of the policy pi. Yeah. Okay. Makes sense, thank you. All right, so if you read the book chapter that I signed, the subsection that I signed, the chapter also actually talks about how to do policy evaluation for computing QPi. Okay, so you can think about QPi as a vector of which the size is S times A, right? Because this, this, this function takes state and action as input. So you can do the same exercise as we just did here, right? Write out the Bellman equation for QPi, combine all the linear constraints together into a big linear system, and then rearrange in terms and try to write out the closed form solution for QPi. Exactly the same you know, exercise, the same process that we went through. All right, so now, uh, this is the summary of the first part, the exact policy evaluation, right? So let me just remind you, it's the computation issue, right? And now we're gonna talk about an approximate algorithm, right? So in a lot of cases, maybe we only care about, you know, a approximate solution, right? So this is sort of the motivation of approximate algorithm. Like computing the exact solution might be very computation heavy, but in reality, we often, you know, just we are very happy about approximate solution, right? A solution that is epsilon close to the sort of the ground truth that we want to compute, right? And the hope is that, you know, we sacrifice this a little bit epsilon, but we save a lot on the computation, right? So in other words, we are trading accuracy for computation, right? So this is the general motivation for those approximate algorithms. Right, so in order to talk about this uh, approximate algorithm, let's take a detour first. Let's talk about fixed point solution. Okay, so I don't know how many of you have taken numerical analysis, but if you have, have you taken any numerical analysis class, then you probably have seen how to solve like this fixed point solution problem. Right, so imagine that I give you a function f. It's a very simple function that maps from you know, 1D to 1D. Right, and I tell you that this function has a fixed point solution, which is x star such that x star equals to f x star, right? So in other words, x star is the fixed point solution of this equation, right? Your goal is to compute x star. Your goal is to find this fixed point solution, x star, right? So the very common approach to find x star is just do this iterative procedure. So I randomly guess a point x zero from this interval, right? And then I just repeatedly apply this function on the points and I iterate, right? So in other words, you can also write this as like 
f f f f blah, 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 x zero. Right, so all I'm doing is just keep iterating. And my hope is that, you know, xt eventually converge to x star, right? Because when this iteration process stopped, right? If I substitute x star into uh, the right-hand side of this equation, right? Then I get x star on the left-hand side by the definition of x star, right? So this iteration process only stop if it finds, if it hits x star, right? And our hope is to show that this iteration process actually Computes something that gradually converges to x star. Right? This is the most common approach that you will use to find a fixed point solution. Right? But you know, we can only show that this convergence under some conditions. Right? It, this is not necessarily gonna, gonna, gonna hold universally. So if f is a contraction map, right? In other words, if you look at the two inputs, x and x prime, right? And you compute the outputs, fx and fx prime. And if the difference between the outputs is actually smaller than the difference between two inputs, so we call this function as a contraction, right? So in other words, you have x, x prime, you map them through this function, fx, fx prime, right? And you look at the difference between two outputs, it's actually smaller than two inputs, right? So that's, that's what I meant by contraction. And if this quantity holds, then you can show that this common approach, this iterative process actually converges, right? xt actually converges to x star. Professor, is that definition equivalent to like getting rid of the gamma and just replacing the less than or equal to with just the less than? Yes. Well, I mean, in some sense, we want to, uh, if you just do less than, um, it's a bit weird because you can talk about a situation where this like less than is arbitrarily, less, less is arbitrarily close to like one or something, right? So here I'm saying that this is less than gamma and the gamma is a quantity that is strictly less than one. Right. I don't want to discuss the situation where you know gamma approach to like you know one minus, right? Okay. Right. So let's just quickly see how why why you know under this contraction condition this iterative process actually converges to x star. Right. So we can just start from x t plus one minus x star. Right? So that's the quantity that we care, right? We care about the difference between the solution from the t plus one iteration to the quantity, the ground truth quantity x star, right? And this by definition, right, is equals to f x t minus f star, right? So first I use the algorithm because x t plus one is computed based on f x t, right? I'm doing iteration. And secondly, I'm mean using the fixed point definition because I know that x star is equal to fx star, right? So this is pure equality. And now I'm gonna use contraction, right? So I know that after, after applying this function f on two points, xt and xt star, the, di the, distance between the, the distance between the outputs actually is smaller than the distance between two inputs, right? So this is less than gamma times the difference between the two inputs, right? So now I get a recursion, right? I know that after I apply this one function, this function f for one time step, I actually get something that is closer to x star comparing to what I had from the previous time step, right? So now you can actually do recursion, right? You can just apply the same sort of analysis. You get a gamma square of x t minus one minus x star and so on and so forth, right? So you get an exponential fast convergence at the end. So it's a very simple proof, right? If you get a contraction, you know, you can keep applying this process over and over again, and then you eventually can show that the difference between xt and x star is shrinking in the order of gamma to the power of t. Right, so this is a very simple 
uh, problem, right? We are just considering this 1D, um, you know, 1D function, but similar analysis can be applied to multi-dimension as well, right? Of course, you needed to talk about contraction in different norm. So here, our distance metric is the absolute difference between two sort of quantities, right? Two scalars. But if you're talking about multi-dimension setting, you're talking about vectors, you have to define the proper you know, uh, metric, distance metric. It could be L2, it could be L1, it could be L infinity as well. All right, any questions about this general uh, fixed point solution algorithm and its analysis? Um, if F is not a contraction mapping, does that mean that there's necessarily there's no fixed point? Yeah, I mean, there might exist a fixed point, right? But this algorithm might not be able to find it. So imagine that your function is only a contraction map at, at the place where like super close to X star, right? But your initial initialization, your initial guess X zero is actually pretty far away from X star, right? So if you run this algorithm, you might actually blow up at the very early stage. Right, so this is like the Newton algorithm, right? So if you actually, in the general setting, if you want the Newton algorithm to converge, you somehow have to start from a point that is very close to the optimal solution, right? So um, it is possible that Newton algorithm actually blow up and you have to use sort of, uh, you know, line search, this kind of stuff to, to, imp to practically ensure Newton's method converge. Okay. Yeah, but luckily for us, you know, the, um, the fixed points equation that we're gonna look into in the next slide is a contraction map. And the fixed point equation that we're gonna look into on Thursday's lecture is also a contraction map because of the discount factor that we introduced in the Markov decision process. All right, so yeah. now let's, let's, let's see why, you know, why uh, this fixed point sort of intuition actually makes sense when we do policy evaluation, right? So the first key observation is that by Bellman equation, this V pi, you know, the quantity that we are interested in computing is actually a fixed point of some equation, right? So we have V pi on the left-hand side and we have V pi on the right-hand side, right? And remember that we did, uh, if we went through the exercise of combining all these linear constraints together as a big linear system, that is the fixed point equation that we get. Right, we have V pi, this whole vector on the left-hand side, and we have V pi as a vector, whole vector on the right-hand side as well, right? And we can define this whole operator, you know, as some function that takes V pi as input and outputs V pi again, right? So in other words, V pi is a fixed point solution of this equation. Right? And again, as I mentioned, you know, in the previous slides, we only looked into the scalar setting, but here it's a vector setting, right? So remember V pi is a vector in R to the S. All right, so now we, we understand that by Bellman equation, you know, the quantity that we wanna estimate, the ground truth quantity V pi, is a fixed point solution of this particular equation, right? So this naturally suggests an algorithm, an iterative algorithm. Right, so the algorithm is very simple, right? This is the algorithm that we just designed for this 1D case, except that now we are doing things for uh, a multi-dimensional setting. So we just start from, Yes. How do, how do we know that F in the previous slide is a, as a contraction mapping? Yes, good question. That's what we're gonna prove. Oh, okay, sorry. Yeah. yeah. Right, so, so let me just, yeah. So let me just describe this algorithm because this is just a one line algorithm, right? You can guess like from the previous slides, uh, you know, how to solve this fixed point iteration, uh, how to find this fixed point solution. So we just guess a V0, right? A V0, uh, is a vector whose, uh, whose value is ranging from zero to one over one minus gamma, right? So the reason that we restrict it to one over one minus gamma, because we know that the quantity that we wanna estimate V pi is never gonna be larger than one over one minus gamma, right? Because our reward function is restricted in zero and one, 
And the maximum reward you can get is one plus gamma plus gamma square plus gamma cube, by the way. So this is one minus one, minus, one over one minus gamma, right? So we know that the maximum value of V pi is at the most one over one minus gamma. So there's no reason for us to guess something, you know, larger than this quantity, right? So in high level, we guess as a, a function V zero, right? And then we just repeat this process, right? We just do this iteration. And our hope is that, you know, VT eventually converge to V pi. Right, so that's the algorithm. And if we can use the sort of the picture that we draw this, this uh, linear algebra picture that we draw from the uh, first algorithm, right? So here it looks very similar, except that now I'm replacing sort of the uh, equality by this particular symbol in a sense that I'm sort of computing a new value and assign it to a new particular vector, Vt plus one. And I'm, I have VT on the right-hand side, I have VT plus one on the left-hand side. And if you just care about one particular iteration, and we can show that this computation for this one iteration is actually a square, right? Because here, what we are doing is just the matrix vector product. Right? We are not doing any matrix inverse yet. So one over s square per iteration. So just to make sure I understand, this like whole thing relies on like theorem two from yet from last class, right? Like the that we're just looking for any v that satisfies the property and that gives us. Yeah, yeah. So this is more. So yes. So the theorem two from the last from Thursday's class is about Bellman optimality. That's about v stop, right? And you a little bit ahead because we're gonna use the theorem two from Thursday's class for computing V star. So here, our problem is actually simpler, right? I give you a policy pi, I'm asking you to compute V pi. So in other words, we only need to use Bellman equation. We don't need to use Bellman optimality yet. Okay, okay. okay right? All right, so why this iterative process makes sense? Right, so let's first, you know, look into this. Let's just compare these two equations, right? And then trying to sort of get a sense of why this is a contraction map, right? So, so if we look at the difference between our current guess, Vt, and our ground truth, V pi, right? So if we sort of believe that our Vt is kind of close to V pi, so let's see the difference between these two is kind of epsilon, right? And let's be a little bit sloppy on the expectation for now. So then we look at the difference between the two quantities after we apply the discount factor. So this is roughly gamma times epsilon, right? And then we look at the difference between two reward vector. So the difference is zero, right? Because we get the correct reward function, right? The reward function is given. So in other words, after we apply this sort of uh, one iteration, right? The difference between Vt plus one and the ground truth Vt is roughly now gamma times epsilon, right? Whatever arrow that we had from the previous iteration, this is discounted by this discount factor gamma, All right? So that's the intuition why this algorithm actually converged and why this alg algorithm converged in a very fa fast speed, gamma to the, you know, the power of gamma. All right, so let's just go ahead and prove that, right? So just formalize, you know, what we saw in the previous slides, right? And uh, one thing that I wanna mention here is that we are using this L infinity norm. So in case you forget the definition of L infinite norm, let's just, let me just remind you. So for a vector V, right, the L infinite norm is max over I, C, D, the absolute value of uh, you know vi, right? So, given you, I, I if I give you a vector, so to compute the L infinity norm, you just look at all the entries in that vector, and you compute the absolute value for a particular entry, and you pick the maximum one. Right? So that's the definition of L infinity norm. All 
right? So if you want to prove that, you know, let's just start from computing the difference between vt plus one and v pi, right? For arbitrary state, I just randomly pick a particular state, for instance, and I'm trying to sort of compute the difference between vt plus one at s and v pi at s. Right. The first step is almost exactly the same as the step that we did for this uh, scalar function, you know, a couple of slides ago. Right. So what I used to here, this is just by algorithm, right? That's just how you know the algorithm construct Vt plus one from Vt. And the second term is just by Bellman equation on V pi. Right? So this is the property of V pi. And now I can just cancel common terms, right? I just cancel the reward function. And that gives me you know, this simplified equation. And I also pulled the discount factor gamma out. And the last equality, uh, the last inequality is actually the inequality that we talked about. We didn't prove, we talked about uh, in, in the first week which is I can actually pull the two expectation. Remember, these are the two same expectation, right? I can pull the expectation outside of the absolute value and I can get this inequality. And in case you haven't, you know, sit down and trying to convince yourself this is true. Uh, so there was a homework zero question uh, where you actually going to prove that this inequality is true. All right, so now this is nice, right? Because the expectation is less than the maximum, right? And the maximum is by definition equals to the L infinite norm between these two vectors. Okay, hope this is not super confusing. So all I'm using here is something like the average is less than the maximum. Right, so expectation of X, F X, is less than max x of x. Okay, so that's the inequality that I'm using. Average is less than the maximum. All right, so that gives us the recursion, right? So we have shown that the L infinity norm between vt plus one and v pi is actually smaller than the L infinity norm of the difference between vt and v pi. Right? So we show this is a contraction. And remember, this is discount factor. So gamma is less than strictly less than what? Right? So now if you repeat the same process, you can basically get something like gamma to the t plus one of v zero minus v pi. Right? So your quantity is convergent to the ground truth v pi exponentially fast. So if we're doing it for all s individually, why are we taking, like, shouldn't like vt of s prime and v prime of s prime just be scalars? Yeah, so the reason is that we want to sort of get this recursion, right, under the same uh, distance metric, under the same L infinite norm. And if you can show that for all s, you know, if you can show that for all s, that vt plus one s minus v pi s is less than gamma times vt minus v pi is L infinite norm, then you can basically argue that this is also true, right? Oh yeah, okay, I see what you're saying. Yeah, let me just uh, you know complete this step in case um, people wanna see it. Right, yeah. Again, you know, if, if this inequality holds for every state, then it must hold for the state that actually achieves the maximum, right? I got it, thanks. All right, so, so as you can, if you still recall, you know, what we did for that scalar function, right? So we are basically repeating the same process, right? We are writing, so starting from the first equality, we're just using, we first use the construction of the algorithm, right? So vt plus one is constructed using vt, right? And then we also apply the Bellman equation because we know that v pi is a fixed point solution of the Bellman equation itself, right? And then we did a little bit of trick by, you know, pulling the expectation outside of the absolute value 
and sort of rewriting things in the L infinite norm, right? But these are, you know, just uh, just detailed tricks, right? But the high level proof idea is basically the same as, you know, how we prove uh, convergence for fixed point iteration for 1D case. Right, so that's the summary for the second algorithm. So we, uh, starting from Bellman equation, right? We realize that the quantity that we want to compute V pi is a fixed point solution of this linear equation, right? And then we realize that, you know, if it's a fixed point solution, then we can actually run this very natural algorithm, right? This very natural iterative uh, fixed point iteration algorithm. So we pick a, pick a V zero, it's our initial guess. And then we just keep, re keep repeating this iteration. Right? Okay. And then we show that this happens to be a contraction map, right? And that gives us this nice convergence guarantee. Uh, Professor, I had a yes. question. Yeah. So uh, when looking at all these kind of problems, if you know that there exists a fixed point, do you need to show that there is a contraction mapping or do you just need to show that the iteration method of yours converges towards like, when you like come up with algorithms such as this, do you look more towards proving that the equation itself is a contraction mapping or whether your iteration method like converges? Like what, are those two one and the same or? Well, I mean, technically they're not, right? If it's a contraction, then it converges. But you might happen to find cases where it converges, but it's not a contraction. Um, and even though the letter I think is very rare, in other words, if your function is not a contraction everywhere, right? So if your initial guess happened to be a point where contraction actually doesn't hold. In other words, after you apply this function f, you know, the, the difference between the outputs actually grow up, right? So that's possible, right? The opposite of contraction. So if your initial guess is, is at those points, then it's hard for you to argue that it will converge. Okay. Right? Does it make sense? Like you could get into the situation where you have two inputs, x and x prime, but if you apply them, the function f, right? You actually, the, the difference between the, the, the two outputs actually get larger, right? And then you do them again, it get even larger, right? Like all we do, we're doing here is the opposite of this picture, right? So we are doing this and we apply, function f again, so on and so forth, right? And we eventually converge. These two routes converge. But you could get into the situation where the two routes actually diverge and actually diverge exponentially fast. So which, in which case is that? Is, it, is that in the case of the algorithm? So for example, in this algorithm, does it work yep. for all x because we've proved that the algorithm, regardless of what you choose v0 to be works or? Uh, well, so for we, we proved that if f is a contraction map, then it works for any initialization. Yeah. Right? But if f is not, then you probably have to be very careful about you know um, which x which initial state you pick. I see. Does that make sense? Like, it, it is it is possible that you know if you look at the the fixed point solution x star, right? If you look at its nearby states, like it's it's infinitesimally small neighbor. So inside that neighbor, it might be a contraction, right? But you have no idea how to actually start yeah, yeah, yeah. inside that neighbor, right? Right. Right. Any other questions? Right. So that's basically the end of this second algorithm. So let's just summarize a bit. We talked about two algorithms to solve this key question, right? So given a Markov decision process, an infinite discounted Markov decision process and a particular policy pi. So in case you got confused, let me just emphasize that this is a deterministic policy. Right? And we divide, we, we, we developed two algorithms that computes V pi S for every S. So the first algorithm is the exact algorithm, right? So we write everything in terms of linear algebra and we take matrix inverse. And the downside of that is that, you know, computing that matrix inverse takes time as, you know, cubic, which is actually computationally inefficient 
and also memory inefficient as well. And then we talked about an approximate algorithm, right? So this iterative policy evaluation algorithm. So we showed a particular convergence guarantee, right? So we showed that the, the difference between our T's iteration solution and the ground truth V pi actually shrinks exponentially fast in the order of gamma to the T, right? So now the question is that, you know, in order to find an epsilon accurate value function, so how many iterations that we need, right? So if you do the calculation, you will see that that's basically the amount of iteration roughly you need, right? So let me just do the calculation in detail for you because we have some time left. So I have VT minus VT pi is less than gamma to the T V zero minus V pi zero, right? Right, so all I want is to find T, right? The correct number of iterations so that the estimation error, the error between VT and V pi is less than epsilon, right? A predefined threshold, accuracy threshold. And this, we just said, you know, the upper bound of the difference between VT and V pi to be epsilon, right? And then now you basically get gamma to the T is less than zero V pi over epsilon, right? And then you take the log on both sides and you rearrange in terms, that's the number of iteration that you need. Now put everything together, we know that every iteration, the computation complexity is S square. Remember in this iterative algorithm, the nicer thing is that we actually just do matrix vector product, right? We never take a matrix inverse. So matrix vector product, the computation is S squared, right? And this is roughly the number of iterations. If we ignoring, you know, those problem dependent constants like one over one minus gamma and one over gamma. Right, so comparing to the exact algorithm, so now you actually just pay S square times log of one over the accuracy. All right, so any questions in terms of how to compute the number of iterations to achieve an absolute accurate uh, solution? You know, the difference between this S cubic, S, S square times log uh, versus, you know, S cubic, the difference between them might not be super big for small S, right? But when your S is like 10, 100K or, you know, millions, then the difference actually shows up, right? You can actually just set maybe epsilon equal to 0 0.01 and you compute the log, right? So this is actually pretty small. And the nice thing of log of one over epsilon is that you can actually set epsilon to be exponentially small. And after you're taking log on one over one, one over epsilon, you know, the, it only scales linearly, right? Right, so um, let me just uh, quickly summarize, you know, the whole lecture. So we focused on computing V pi for a particular policy pi, right? So we started basically saying that, you know, our event ultimate goal is to compute the optimal policy, right? But in order to select, you know, an optimal policy outside of this S to the A to the S many policies, we needed to first figure out how to actually evaluate each policy, right? So that's the whole goal motivation of this lecture. And we started from Bellman equation and we realized that you know, Bellman equation tells us that V pi, the quantity that we want to estimate is actually a fixed point solution of this particular linear equation, right? And then we happen to know that there exists a general framework, algorithmic framework for solving fixed point solution, right? So which is uh, sort of the 1D toy problem that we looked at, right? We just iteratively, iteratively apply the same function over and over again. And our hope is that you know, it will converge under some condition. And if you combine these two together, right, we actually arrived at the algorithm that we just talked about. This is iterative policy iteration. We make a guess, V0, and then we just iteratively apply this equation over and over again. Right? And then later on, what we proved is that this fixed point equation, you know, thanks to this discount factor gamma, this actually is a contraction map, 
In other words, given two inputs, you apply this equation on two inputs and you compute the difference between the two outputs, right? Under L infinity norm, this is a contraction. You know, the difference between the two outputs is actually smaller than the difference between two inputs. Right? And then you use the general analysis framework of this fixed point iteration together with the property of contraction, we arrive at this theorem, right? this convergent theorem, where we show that the difference between Vt and Vpi is actually exponentially small right? in the order of gamma to the power of t. So that's basically the whole picture of today's lecture. You know, I kind of ignored about the exact computation because um, it's really computation heavy. And most of the time in practice, you're actually using the, you're gonna use this kind of uh, iterative algorithm to compute. All right, so that's pretty much the end of today's lecture. And for the next two lectures, now we understand how to compute V pi for a particular given pi. We, in the next two lectures, we're going to focus on actually how to select pi star from a to the S many policies. All right, so the next two lectures, we're really gonna get into the real beef of Markov decision process, right? In other words, we're going to care about the ultimate goal, which is